Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nina Sclafani, and I am the Senior Events Coordinator at Tech. You may have met me at a previous in-person conference, but if not, I'm happy to meet you today at our virtual summit. We're thrilled to bring educators together in the Teaching and Learning Transformation 2021 event, hosted by Tech and Smart Technologies. We're so happy you could join us. This past year, educators transformed the way they taught, whether that came from where students learned, the technology used, or the way lesson delivery was modified. Educators like you stayed on your toes and ensured that students felt supported. During this two-day conference, we will have a variety of PD sessions and exhibitor booths with strategies and tools to help educators like you stay flexible and prepared this year. Topics will include hybrid strategies, transitional tools, funding, and more. We thank you all for joining us and helping make this summit a reality. There's nothing more powerful than bringing you all together to discuss real impactful and innovative ways that we can all work together to continue to push education forward. In just a moment, I will introduce you to our presenters for the SEL Tools for Active Learning session. But before I do, I would like to mention a couple of quick housekeeping items. During the presentation, if you have any questions as we go along, please type those into the chat box and we will voice them to the group as we review any outstanding questions at the end of the presentation. We encourage you to share your experience about this session and the event overall by completing the survey at the end follow hashtag smart360 for the latest news and announcements for this summit and all of the events planned at smart360. For today's session, SEL tools for active learning, I am pleased to introduce you to Chris Astle from Smart Technologies and Chrissy Rebert from Tech. Welcome ladies. Welcome, Nina, thank you for the great introduction and welcome everyone to our session today on embedding SEL in active learning. So I'm Chris Astle, uh, like Nina said, I am with SMART. Um, I came to SMART with about 18 years of mostly international education experience um, and I've been in the role as global education strategist for a while now, almost 10 years. Um, really, really excited to be here today, really, really excited to share this with you. Um, and let me turn it over so Chrissy can introduce herself. Hello and welcome and thanks again, Nina, and thanks, Chris. I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. My name is Chrissy Rebert and I'm the Vice President of Global Instructional Solutions with Tech. Um, I too have over 20 years worth of experience in education and came from the classroom myself. And I'm really happy to share with you guys today how we are going to embed SEL actively into our lessons. So welcome. All right, so let's dive right in and chat for a second about what you guys can expect from the session today. So we're gonna start off by talking a little bit about why SEL matters. Then we're gonna dive into some best practices when creating um, learning experiences in your classroom to build your students' SEL skills. And then we're actually gonna pull you into a lesson. So we wanna give you an opportunity to experience this um, from the student perspective. So we'd love for all of you to join and participate in that lesson towards the end of our session. And as always, feel free to answer or ask any questions in the chat box. We'll be manning it throughout this um, session and happy to answer any questions. Exactly. Yeah. So feel free to share or ask anything you'd like in the chat as we move through this. So I wanted to kick us off today with a quote to just kind of get us get us thinking about SEL and the role that it plays in the classroom. And I really liked this because it talked about, you know, we need to embrace our feelings. We need to use our feelings to, to learn and to engage. And so helping our students understand how to recognize and interact with and gain energy from and move forward from their feelings, I think is super important. It's not that we're boxing them up and putting them away, but that we're really learning the strategies that our students need to, um, to use what they're feeling to actually drive their learning. So when we talk about social emotional learning, we're really talking about a number of skills that students need. And these skills, I think, are increasingly important and increasingly valuable as we look at the, the work that our students are doing and we look at the experiences that they're bringing to the classroom. And so when we talk about SEL, we're really talking about helping our students understand and manage their emotions being able to set and plan goals. So, so think about where they are and where they're going and how they're going to get there. 
to feel and show empathy for others, which really becomes kind of key as we look in at working in teams or working in groups and a lot of these skills that are important for our students as they go out into the careers that they pursue after school. The same is true for um, establishing and maintaining positive relationships, like really learning how to work and interact with each with other people to drive whatever they're doing forward and then to make responsible decisions. So all of these are important skills that we A, need to teach directly to our students, but that we can also kind of embed around all of the content instruction that we're doing. So they get to practice those alongside their content knowledge and content skills. Sure. And when you think about your social and emotional learning, think of it from different perspectives. When you are embedding this into your lessons, you want to look at the intellectual piece and give the students their choice, the emotional piece and reflection on how they're feeling and monitor that, the behavioral, give them um, different different ways to work in groups, to work with their peers, um, physical, game-based activities. You'll see a lot of what Chris is going to bring into these lessons. And then of course, the social piece with the collaboration. And remember, as Chris stated, social and emotional learning addresses the national challenge that many students, um, graduates, don't have the skills to be successful. So social and emotional learning should not be an added, but should definitely be embedded into all of your, your teaching and learning. Yeah, exactly. So um, let's talk a little bit about how we can set students up for success in the classroom and the things that we want to think about when we are designing learning experiences for them that help us learn both the content and then build the SEL alongside of it. So the one at the top is probably the one that's most important to me. And so this is establishing classroom discussion or collaboration protocols. When we think about everything that's happened in 2020, 2021, it's been a lot. And we've got students who are coming into our classrooms from all varieties of backgrounds, with all varieties of needs, with all different levels of stress. And we want to make sure that we are valuing everyone's voice and the contribution that every individual makes to the classroom. And so by setting up protocols, we create a clear pathway or a clear method for communicating with each other that elevates every student's voice and makes sure every student's voice is heard. And I think, you know, this is super important when we're face to face in the classroom, but when we're navigating kind of this new world of remote learning and remote collaboration and how we interact with each other, making sure that we've got protocols set up that allow every student to contribute and every student to feel valued for their contribution is super important. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into collaboration protocols as we move forward. Um, using current topics to foster self-awareness. So there's a lot that, that happens. There's a lot we can unpack from the statement. So students come into our classrooms with lots of questions about what's going on in the world around them. And that can lead to varying degrees of stress. There's a lot of emotions attached to that. And helping students unpack those and then develop those SEL skills alongside of that, that really develops their self-awareness. They start to understand their emotions, where those emotions are coming from, how they can direct those emotions in a positive way, but it also builds their empathy for other students as we get to see different perspectives and understand different perspectives. Um, the next one, providing students with opportunities to reflect on their identity and equity to build self-awareness. Again, you know, as we kind of look through this lens of what's happening in the world today, helping students understand who they are, where they are, where they're coming from, and how they relate to everyone around them is really key to kind of helping support equity and helping students understand how they fit in to a community um, and a team. Designing lessons to promote collaboration and invite student input. The more we can let students drive their own learning, the more connected they're going to be to it, and the more engaged and involved they are. And as we give them input, we'll find that a lot of these, these SEL skills, we're naturally building them because students are sharing, they're collaborating, they're talking and they're discussing with each other and they're practicing all of these things they're gonna need to go out and be successful. Another one that I really like is consider giving each group a different task. So when we're dividing students into group work, we're setting up, you know, collaborative experiences for them to, you know, practice skills like active listening, discussing, mediating conflict. And then they're coming back and they're teaching each other at the end of this group work. By giving each group a different task, we're allowing students to, you know, pursue things that are of interest to them, but then to come back and really bring value to the whole discussion as they share their group's perspective on the learning that they did. 
And then really, really important is always allowing time for group and individual reflection. So when we think about, you know, teaching students to set goals, teaching students to move forward in their learning, it's really about understanding what I've done and where I'm going and how am I doing? How have I made progress? And so at the end of an activity, building in time for them to reflect on how their group did and how they did individually and what their next goal can be is super important. And Chris, I'm answering the chat. So there is a question regarding, is there anything that'll go along additional resources? So I have put in the chat my email. Feel free to email me. I'm happy to provide you with different resources that will help you to um, allow your children to collaborate, even if they are six feet apart, because we know this is a big challenge day. And you'll see in, in Chris's lesson that With Smart Learning Suite Online, that is one way that students can collaborate, even if they're working individually um, with their uh, their own devices. And that's such a great point. So as we kind of dive further into this, I'm going to take everything that we're talking about now and deliver it in a lesson that shows you what it could look like. And again, um, Chris has got plenty more resources to support you in that area. So I want to chat for a minute about discussion protocols. So I mentioned those on the previous slide, and this is something that um, I think is really, really key to making sure all of our students have a voice. So when our students come to us in the classroom, they've got different backgrounds. They may have, you know, different English language skills. We've got English language learners in our classroom. Um, And so we want to make sure that everyone has a voice and has time to think, talk, and listen. And so by setting up kind of a structure for all group communications, we've got a process that allows our students to make sure that they get to talk, get to listen, and get to, you know, give feedback and share feedback when they discuss issues together. And so when we're designing these structures, it's really important that they honor the knowledge and perspective that each student brings to the conversation. And so allowing those students to, you know, (laughs) use the language they're comfortable using, communicate in ways that are comfortable for them based on, you know, where they are with their language skills, give students agency in directing the conversation. So, you know, tough conversations happen um, and letting our students drive this in the area that they have questions or they have interests is really important. And then making sure that we're giving those marginalized students greater access to the discussion. So when we set up these protocols, and I'll share an example when we get into the lesson, we're really making sure that everyone gets to talk, that everyone gets to have feedback from the group, and that everyone gets to respond to that feedback so that we're really seeing the greatness that each individual student brings to the conversation and the diversity that they bring which at the same time is going to, A, make our students feel like this classroom is a safe place, and then allow them at the same time to develop those SEL skills um, alongside of the content that they're talking about. So some ideas for ways that we can build this into the classroom. So all of these techniques can be used both face-to-face or remotely or in a socially distanced classroom using a tool like Smart Learning Suite Online. So the first one is a gallery walk and kind of your traditional gallery walk has students kind of walking around um, and leaving commentary on different pieces of paper. We can do this super easily in a digital environment using Smart Learning Suite. We just create a workspace and our students can come and digitally respond to each other. Um, Another idea I really like to make sure that we're kind of getting all students involved and giving all students a voice is taking something like a chalk talk and turning it into a graffiti tag billboard. And what this means is that my students aren't necessarily just writing their responses. They could be drawing their responses. They could be, you know, adding any type of creativity that brings the learning along further. And that's going to meet all of my students where they are. It's going to either capture their individual skills and talents as they, you know, draw a response Um, And it's also going to give access to our students who may not be proficient in English yet by giving them the opportunity to give a representation of their learning as well. Um, Something like Jigsaw. I love Jigsaw. Um, Things like Think, Pair, Share, Jigsaw are great kind of cooperative learning activities that allow all of our students to interact with each other. And when we do a team Jigsaw, um, this is an example of the protocol. So I have my group, maybe a group of four. The presenter is going to talk for five minutes uninterrupted. Everyone else in the group has five minutes to reflect and respond to the presenter's info. And then the presenter has one minute to respond to that. So again, really starting to structure that discussion among my students, make sure everyone has a voice and make sure everyone is heard. And Chris, we had a question from someone who is a counselor and I did respond in the chat box, but I wanted to let you know that 
75% of educators say that SEL helps even with like the anti-bullying and you're asking if there are different ways that um, you can address it from your perspective and there's something called a responsive classroom which is um, a pedagogical approach that focuses on how you can both teach and interact with students. It provides you with different strategies, structures, practices, different types of techniques that can improve student self-efficacy and can really impact their social and emotional as well as academic um, learning. So I'm happy to share those again, feel free to just send me a quick email and I can give you other um, resources that can assist you in, in your, um, with your particular students. Awesome. Yeah. So great resources there. Um, anything else before we jump into um, our lesson? Okay. Chris is silent. Can I just say one other thing? Of course. Um, Research shows that 81% of, of teachers state that the biggest challenge for them is the, is the time, and I'm sorry, my video just went off, is the time that they have to take to teach um, social and emotional learning. And so I want everyone to play, pay really close attention to what Chris is going to scaffold here in her lesson and really, and really see that it doesn't take a lot of time. And if you are able to embed some of these strategies into your actual lessons, that you'll see that it actually increases the amount of task time. So I just really want everyone to pay very close attention and realize it's not that hard to embed it and it doesn't take a lot of time. It's just really taking a look at some of the strategies that you're putting forth today. And that's a, that's a great point, right? When we're able to kind of build and blend this SEL into our actual instruction, it's not something that we have to pull out all the time and teach SEL. We can be setting up these learning opportunities where it's kind of a natural part of that group collaboration that these skills are then learned by students. So really quickly before we jump into the lesson. So thinking about things that are really important when we're embedding SEL, number one is to scaffold the experience. And I think this is super important for our young learners, but it's true all the way up through our high school learners. There's skills that we need to directly teach them and allow them to practice before we incorporate that into an entire lesson. And doing things like providing students with graphic organizers and other organizational tools along the way is really going to help them as they develop these skills. Uh, protocols, like I said, having protocols so that we always know how to participate and that all students have a voice in the lesson creating that classroom community. So making sure that our students have the opportunity to connect to each other. And we'll look at that a little bit in the lesson today. And especially as you know, we're socially distanced or we're still remote, the more opportunities we can provide for our students to connect with each other, the more we're gonna benefit that SEL growth. And then, you know, letting students lead, meeting them where they are and allowing them to direct the, dis direct the discussion and the learning and supporting them and jumping in and maybe scaffolding some of the skills they need when they get to parts in the discussion of the learning that are tough for them. We help teach them those skills so that they can kind of continue on that pathway of continuing to learn and collaborate with each other. All right, so we've kind of addressed some of the questions. So what I'm gonna do is um, put you guys into my lesson. So I'd love to have all of you join. You can open up another browser tab. You can join on your phone or another device if you've got one handy, but you're gonna to go to hellosmart.com. You are gonna join as a guest and you're gonna enter my code, which is 979887. And I'll give everybody a second to do that. Chris, while we're waiting, just think about um, the key components that accelerate the social and emotional learning within your district is really having that school-wide program. So having your counselors on board and your administration on board, as well as your teachers, embedding it obviously into your learning as we are doing, and then also engaging your families, the community, the parents, and then the last is professional development. Just as some of you are asking for different resources, there are a lot of um, free resources that you can look at that will give you strategies and different instructional tools to, to help you implement this successfully. Yeah, great point. All right, I see quite a few people joining. I'm gonna give you guys another second just to make sure everyone's in. Um, and Chrissy, can you pop my class code in the chat as well? And uh, yes, I believe Jen just did that. So All right. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to navigate to the next page and get us started in the lesson. But the code, if you haven't gotten it, um, is in the chat. Okay. So this lesson I put together on kind of talking a little bit about politics in the classroom and, you know, getting students to collaborate and learn and understand from each other. So in this lesson, we are going to talk about evaluating the inaugural address. 
So the first thing I want to start out with here is just, you know, a little activation of prior knowledge and getting students to kind of have some emotional awareness about what's happening. So the first question we're going to start with is why is talking about politics so hard? And the tool I'm using here is Shout It Out. And I love using this tool to just kind of get students ideas. So that whole class brainstorming. And let me see here. There we go. All right. So when this launches, and I apologize, my internet feels very slow this morning, students are going to be able to um, share with me their thoughts. And when I set this up, the first thing I did is set it to um, anonymous. So I don't see any student initials or student names. And students are just going to share with me like why they think this is so hard. And we'll spend a little bit of time doing that. And then I'm going to move to another question to kind of help them think about strategies we've already talked about in class for how we respond to each other when we disagree. Um, go ahead and start this. And same thing, students are going to have the opportunity to just share their ideas. I can organize those responses. And then we can have a classroom dialogue that just kind of activates that prior knowledge and sets the stage before we move into the actual learning. All right. How about that for technology being a little fun this morning? Um, give me two seconds. I'm going to pop you guys out for a second. My apologies and relaunch my file. And we'll try that again. How about that? So, Chrissy, any questions we can answer in the chat while I move us forward here? I think we are all up to date at this point. All right. Okay. So how about lots of technology fun this morning? See if my next page is going to work. Okay. Chrissy, you're going to say a bunch of really smart things and I am going to try to get us sorted out here. Okay, so as Chris is trying to restart this and, and sign herself in, for those that you were actually asking how you can collaborate with the Smart Learning Suite Online, and Chris is showing us now, just the shout it out activity. You can also use this just as a, as a quick mood meter. How are you feeling today? Chris is going to show us um, their pages that are both handouts where students can work individually, but if we want to collaborate, um, they can work in workspaces. So even from their individual devices, we can have the students put into their, um, to work peer to peer. We can have them working in small groups so that they're collaborating even in this social distancing atmosphere. So whether we have some kids that are in, at home or we have some kids that are in the classroom, we can all be working together. Look at that magic. You started talking Ooh. and now everything is back the way it yes. should be. Perfect. All right. I apologize, everyone, for that small technical interruption. Never happens to any of us, right? Yeah. Um, so once I've used the shout it out to activate prior knowledge, I'm going to do a tiny bit of direct teaching. Um, and again, like this is really designed to be an active learning lesson. I want my students doing most of the engaging with the content, and I want them doing it in a lot of collaborative ways. We've scaffolded those collab collaboration um, activities using our classroom protocols so that my students are really practicing these SEL skills. So we do a little bit of direct teaching, and then I'm going to pop them in to an activity. So the first thing I want them to do is in groups, I'm gonna have them watch uh, President Roosevelt's 1933 inaugural address. So um, they're gonna watch the YouTube video, they're gonna listen for the points he makes and their historical relevance, and they're gonna use our class discussion protocols to complete the group workspace. So I've got this all scaffolded out for them. So I'm gonna remind them right here of our protocols. In my class, I'm changing the time for that procedure depending on what type of activity we're doing. So here in this particular activity, they know they've got three minutes to share their thoughts. The group has three minutes to respond and then the presenter has one minute for comments and then they'll move through the group. So I like to just remind them of that. Mm -hmm. And then I've embedded this for a minute. That right there is self-management. So how easily it is embedded to just a quick YouTube, understanding what your protocols are and managing your own time. Yep, exactly. And so all of that comes very naturally. And so you'll see that this is just in the flow of the actual instruction and not something that I'm actively pulling out. So I've embedded the YouTube here, which makes it super easy for my students to watch it if they're in the classroom, if they're at home, because we're still doing remote learning, and they can kind of stop 
go back, evaluate it. So I'll give them a fair amount of time to watch this so that they really have time to kind of think about it, analyze it. It's important to allow that processing time for all of our students in the classroom. And then from there, I've got a workspace that I've set up for my students. So this, like Chrissy mentioned earlier, is a great tool for putting my students into groups and allowing them to contribute here. So I've set this up as a whole class, but you'll see this is kind of that graphic organizer, right? That I'm helping them scaffold this, like key points in here, historical relevance. And then as a group, they'll fill that out. I can come in and kind of support them both synchronously and asynchronously, depending on how we're learning. I can see who's contributed to the workspace. And then I can give some feedback in here as well, maybe a question to guide their learning, maybe some you know, commentary on how they're working as a group. So again, we're looking, we're working at we're working on content here. We're looking at this through the lens of what we're learning, but I'm still overlapping and scaffolding those SEL skills around it. And so thinking of the five core competencies, anytime you do any kind of cooperative, collaborative, or peer-to-peer -peer interaction, you are working on that social awareness. Exactly. So from there, once they've done that, um, another great active learning tool that I like is brainstorming. And so I want to have them do a group brainstorm about the key political issues this year. Again, I've got the protocols. I've adjusted the time for this activity. So we've got one minute, one minute, and 30 seconds setting up kind of my expectations, but making sure everyone has a voice. And so they're going to do a, another workspace activity. So this is just a brainstorming web I've set up for them. So this time I might put my class into groups of four. So I've got five students in each group. You'll see how everybody gets spread out in groups right there. I can move people around if I wanted to. So if I wanted to do a little adjusting, I can. And then I simply pass that out to my class. I can jump into any team and see how they're doing. So I've just simply used a template here. This is one of the templates that comes with um, Smart Learning Suite Online. Reminded them in the center what they're working on, and then they just get to brainstorm here. So again, they're talking, they're collaborating, they're agreeing, they're maybe disagreeing, they're practicing navigating that disagreement. Um, and it gives them the opportunity to work on those SEL skills while they're working on their content knowledge at the same time. So from here, I'm gonna move them into this year's uh, presidential address. So same thing, they're gonna watch the YouTube video, they're gonna listen for key points, and then they're gonna use their class discussion protocols to compare the key points that they saw in this address with what they put in their brainstorm. So they agreed as a group what the important issues were, and now they're gonna do some comparison to what actually is happening. And so same process here. I've got the YouTube video embedded right there. So it's easy for them to find. They've got access to the resources. And then I'm going to pop them into this workspace. And again, I've just scaffolded this for them. So given them a bit of a graphic organizer, what are the ideas that only your group had? What are the ideas your group had that appeared in the address? And what are the ideas that were just in the inaugural address? So really kind of separating all of that out. Again, looking at differences, looking at different viewpoints, having some time to really develop their self-awareness of what they think and what others around them think. Chris, can we stop for a minute? Is there any yes. questions? P please feel free to put them in the chat. If you um, wanna know more about this and how Chris created this, just let us know. Yep, we're definitely happy to answer those. Um, so now, you know, this is an activity I mentioned in the presentation I really like is using Team Jigsaw. So each member of the group is going to go out. They're going to find an inaugural address that resonates with them. So again, allowing the students to connect to the learning. When was there addre an address? When was there a year that really connected or resonated with issues that are important to them? I've given them the activity. They're going to summarize the key points. They're going to share with their group what impacted them the most. And they're going to call out anything unique or new that maybe changed in terms of traditions in that address. And then again, I am scaffolding this for them. I've got a workspace where I put them into groups. And the great thing about these workspaces is I can use them in the classroom. If we're socially distanced in the classroom, my students can still be working in groups by typing or adding content to the page. And if they're completely remote or they're hybrid, I can pair my workspace with my video conferencing breakout groups and put them into virtual groups as well. So it doesn't matter what type of learning we're doing, 
we can do this in all environments. And I think that's super important. And Chris gave the opportunity for student choice. She's giving the opportunity for that peer-to-peer -peer, um, interaction and relationship building and really making their own like responsible decisions based off of what they have to go out and pull in and discuss with their peers. Exactly. And then that teaching each other too, like helping them see the value that each of them brings, you know, to the discussion. I think that's super important. So again, I've just set this up here where everyone can record their information and, you know, discuss it as a group in whatever format that happens to be. And then from there, the final thing is again, really, you know, giving students voice, connecting them to the learning. The last activity I'll have them do is create their own inaugural address. What are the issues that are important to them and how would they address them? Now, again, because I really want to make sure I'm building voice and choice into this, what I'm truly evaluating here are my students' ideas, what's important to them and how they would present them to an audience. So I'm not super concerned about the format that they do it in. Again, I want to help my students pick their skills, pick their strengths, and use those to enhance the learning. So I let them pick any format they want here. It could be written, it could be audio only, it could be video, it could be illustrated. But again, I'm getting to all of the students in my class by finding a way for them to share this that they feel confident about. And then last thing, um, super important. So this is actually a handout activity. And in the handouts, what I'm doing and I'll just pop into one right here, is giving each individual student um, a page to interact with. So up until now in this uh, lesson, we've been doing the workspaces where I've got my students in virtual groups together. Now I'm going to hand out this page to each student individually so they can do a little reflection. What did they do well? What did their group do well with? Where do they still need help? What are areas of growth for them that I can help support them? Uh, and just like all of the other activities we did as a teacher, I've got access to come in and add images, add text, um, add annotations to support them, give them feedback here, uh, and help move them along with their learning. And Chris, I want to point out, because Joseph, um, one of our attendees had said that even with his ELL students, he has them... Um, kind of identify how they're feeling. So this is one of those mood meters to determine where they're at, how comfortable they are. Um, and Chris doesn't have this on here, but you can actually embed your own voice as well to give directions. So for those student population shows of those ones that you had identified, you can actually um, play back on the top right-hand corner would be like a little picture of, almost of a, of a head and you can mm -hmm. actually record your own um, self speaking and then walk them through if, if they need a little help with that. Yeah, and that's a great point because that, you know, when we're doing these types of activities, when we've got, you know, English language learners who need a bit more support, if we're doing this remotely and there's some asynchronous learning involved, I can create a guided asynchronous experience that, again, you know, promotes active learning, incorporates SEL, and meets the needs of all of our learners really quickly and really easily. Okay, so... um. We are at kind of the Q&A portion of today. What other stuff would we like to dive into or what other questions do we have, Chrissy? I will um, show this page really quickly. So if you guys liked the template that I used for this, it is from SlidesGo. Um, I love using SlidesGo templates. They're free. Um, you just download them, Google or Google Slides or PowerPoint, depending on which platform you use. I put my content in there, upload it to... Um, Smart Learning Suite online. And that's where I add all the interactive kind of active learning pieces that allow for collaboration and super easy, uh, quick to do. So Chris, we have a question for younger students. Is there a way they can record their voice instead of type? Yeah. So um, a lot of that's going to depend on tools that you're like using Google in thing. the classroom. We don't have anything built into Smart Learning Suite on, online to let them record their voice, but there's some, you know, workarounds there depending on what other supportive tools you have. They can, though, I will say um, adding images, like I was pulling things in. That. Yep. Like that's what I really like. And I like it for my older, you know, ELL students too, um, because you can grab an image. They can do a quick search for that. There's a lot of different ways for them to bring things in if they're not quite writing fluently or they're not comfortable with that. Or you can have images already on there where they're just circling how they feel or the comfort level if you were um, asking about the actual handout. Yep. Or moving them around too. So if I had, you know, a group where I had a lot of students who were kind of, you know, with emerging language skills, we could set that up completely. So they're simply moving images around or even moving words around that they recognize to, um, to get to the outcome that we're looking for. 
Any other questions? Anything that you want to see while Chris is in this lesson? Those templates. Yep, I can show you guys the templates. I can actually show you how to add audio. We can jump out really quickly and do mm -hmm. that. Christy, it's probably a great okay. idea. So I'm just going to edit this lesson right here. So this is going to pull you into editing mode. And so super easy. You'll see right here, if I want to add sound, all I have to do is start my recording. Just like that, I start talking and then pause to review. If I like it, boom, it's added to my page. So that's really easy to do. And in terms of other... To, oh, sorry, Chris. I was going to say, you don't have to create everything in the smart learning suite online as well. You can upload from a PowerPoint, from the Google slides, from a PDF as well. And in that editing mode, you can add these templates, the graphic organizers, the questions. Yeah, and that's the beauty of it. So if you have content that you've already been using, start with that. There's no need to recreate the actual direct teaching or you know content we wanna share there that we just pull it into smart learning suite online. And then add the, you know, the interactive components and the collaborative components that really create those active learning experiences that support SEL. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see right here, there's tons of graphic organizers of the brainstorming web that I used, but all of these are ready to go. It's one click and you can add them to your presentation, which I really like. And then a lot of this other stuff. So activating prior knowledge, questioning reflection, a lot of these other things that really, you know, allow our students to have some voice and share what they've learned. Mm -hmm. They're right there and easy to add to the lesson. And Chrissy mentioned at the beginning too, game-based I, activities. So I usually have a good game-based activity in my lesson, um, but I really like things like Monster Quiz is a great active learning game. And we know that incorporating games and having some kind of you know collaborative team activity there is a great way to build SEL skills in the mm -hmm. classroom. And even the flip out cards for your ELL students, they're one of my favorites. You can add a picture to one side and a word to the other, and they you can manipulate them and move them. So that's a great way for students to, to, to do a mood check. How are they feeling? What is their understanding? Or even putting different words on there so they can um, move the flip out cards around so that they can create a sentence. Yep. So lots of different fun, interactive ways for students to participate. Exactly. And as you guys, it's super easy to edit and finish editing here. And then if you're, let me return home for a second. So I'm going to take you guys out. So this is just my dashboard here and you'll see right here, add activities, super easy. It's going to load a little slowly, but I can bring in, you know, anything that I'm already using. So, you know, files from Google, PDFs, PowerPoint, notebook, whatever you want, you can bring it in and then add all of this other stuff to it super easily. Other questions, Chrissy? One just came in. Is there a way for students to see their classmates' feedback on their own device versus looking at a teacher's presentation? I'm just starting out with SLS and struggling with figuring out what the students are seeing. So there's a way for students to see the classmates feedback on their own device. If you're in those handout or you're in those workspaces, then you can see what the students um, are, are, are saying, whether it's through the typing, th whether it's through the writing, you can see what they're saying. And from the teacher perspective, you have the ability to see each group that you have assigned and what they are, are adding to their workspace. Exactly. So if you're setting up an activity where you want students to see each other's feedback, then that's where you'll really want that workspace because they're going to see what they've added. They're going to see what their group members have added. They'll see what you as a teacher have added all in that same digital space. So they're not having to look at the teacher screen. And so that really supports the asynchronous experience. It supports group work in all environments. And it you know, allows them to kind of start to, to navigate some of those group dynamics together. And Chris, can you pop out for a moment? Yeah. If you are just starting, so with tech, we do have otis.tech.com, um, which is our online professional learning, which is both synchronous and asynchronous. And then also within your dashboard of Smart Learning Suite Online, that little training, that um, gray little uh, rectangle shape on the right-hand side will give you additional resources too if yep. you have specific questions. And so I'll put, all kinds of resources to support you. I'll put Otis in here as well. Great. And then there's.
There's another question, Chris. I have some TPT activities, but the objects are not moving on the screen. Is that for all movable pieces? I'm not sure I understand that. I have some TPT activities, but the objects are not moving on the screen. It's probably going to depend on how you got those images into Smart Learning Suite Online. So that one, I would say, uh, reach out, send us an email, and we can kind of talk. We can look at the original file and see what's yeah. going on there for sure. I'm not seeing any, Chris. All right. Again, both Chris and I are available. Should you have any questions that you think of after, or you want those additional resources to help support your student population, feel free to reach out to us. We are, we're always available to answer and, and assist you in any way possible. Appreciate you guys joining us. So thank yep. you. Thanks everyone.